Okay, everyone, we're just getting everyone in from the waiting room um, and everything. So hope everyone's Wednesday is going good. Uh, while we do that, I'll do the introduction. So hello and uh, welcome to episode six. I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series. Digging In is a series of live presentations with scholars from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We are going to begin with a land acknowledgement for the land that the Peabody Institute and its school, Phillips Academy, are on. So Phillips Academy occupies the land of the Patuxet peoples and the land of the contemporary Abenaki, Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Wabanaki, Poconoka, and Nipmung nations. We honor all indigenous people who are here now, have been here for, for time and memorial and will be here in the future. And we acknowledge indigenous genocide and the continued oppression of native peoples, voices, cultures, and spiritualities. We understand how education has been used by settler institutions and in the attempted erasure of indigenous people. And we commit to interrogating the histories of and our complicity in colonization, centering native voices and communities and dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism at Phillips Academy and beyond. So join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time through June for our presentations. For a schedule of dates and presenters, please visit us at pbd.andover.edu and at the Massachusetts Archaeological Facebook page. And if you're enjoying our programming, consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We're able to bring you outstanding programming through the support of viewers like you. And today we are very excited to walk to welcome Dr. Stacy Camp. Stacy Camp is an associate professor of anthropology and the director of campus archaeology program at Michigan State University. Her research focus on the archaeology of migrant communities and disenfranchised groups in the historic Western United States. And during and at the conclusion of the talk, viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the Q&A function or the chat function. Um, and then we'll give our speaker time to answer as many questions as she can with the understanding we might not get to all of them. So welcome, Dr. Camp, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me in for that lovely introduction. I'm really excited to be here and I will definitely do my best to leave a, a good amount of time for questions. All right, I'm gonna turn on my PowerPoint. Hopefully it doesn't collapse my computer. Let's see. Go and try to expand that slideshow. All right, can you see that? It's full screen, it's all good, awesome. All right, well, the title of my talk today is The Archaeology of Japanese American Incarceration slash Internment During World War II. And before I started, I just wanted to suggest two organizations that our participants today could check out. If you have the money, donate to them. Whenever I get honorariums, I try to donate a chunk of the money. It's usually all of it to these organizations. So the first one is Stop AAPI Hate. And the second one is Densho. And I've spent a lot of time utilizing and harvesting Densho's digital repository. Densho is uh, an organization that is committed to studying and sharing the stories of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated and interned during World War II. So if you have time today, definitely check this website out. It's got fantastic oral stories, histories, videos, photographs, everything you can think of relating to World War II incarceration. All right, so this is the outline of my presentation today. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about why heritage matters because I'm guessing a lot of people that are uh, tuning in already understand what archaeology is. Sometimes when I give this talk, people don't know what I do or what archaeologists do, so I'll skip that part. But then I will start the talk with the historical background and the context of Japanese American incarceration, what it entailed. I could spend hours and hours talking about this history. There's great books on the topic. So if you're interested, definitely check out other materials on this topic because I'll, I'll be spending just a little bit of time on that context. Then I'll talk about what uh, brought me to the archeological site that I've excavated since 2010. That is a World War II Japanese American internment camp located in rural North Idaho. I will talk about our research, what we did when we got out to the site, and of course, what we discovered. What did we find? I know everyone wants to see the artifacts. Then I'll talk a little bit about the outreach that we've done, depending on how the time goes. And I'll conclude with a discussion of 
the lessons learned and future directions in research. All right, so as I said, I'm gonna cover the historical background of why Japanese Americans were incarcerated during World War II in a very brief manner, um, just so that those of you who don't know this history or don't know a lot about it have that context. So on February 19th, 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, which allowed the United States government to build prisons or what we call internment camps for Japanese Americans living in the United States. At that time, approximately 120,000 Japanese Americans were forced into prisons and internment camps, with over two thirds of them being US citizens. So the people that were incarcerated had committed no crimes, had done nothing other than they were Japanese Americans. Their only crime was being of that heritage. Um, so announcements about incarceration were made on the radio, in newspapers, and posted on signs in Japanese American neighborhoods. Because the government didn't have enough space to readily incarcerate 120,000 people immediately, many Japanese Americans were placed into temporary housing facilities until more permanent housing could be built. These facilities included race tracks and fairgrounds that were completely unsuitable for human habitation. So when people arrived at what they called these assembly centers awaiting transfer to a more permanent location, they found they had hot, no hot water, um, no medical treatment, no sanitary napkins, nothing that they would need in order to survive there safely. So World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans involved multiple levels of violence inflicted upon the Japanese American community, including cultural, physical, economic, and linguistic violence. In terms of cultural violence, Japanese Americans were not supposed to speak Japanese in incarceration facilities. The schools that children attended in internment camps were designed to eradicate what were identified as Japanese traits, even though, again, Japanese Americans were citizens, had been here for quite a long time, um, but were targeted because of their ethnicity. Uh, Japanese Americans were not allowed to bring in cameras into incarceration facilities, although some of them did actually build photography studios under their barracks that they weren't supposed to and were able to take some photographs of important lives, uh, moments, people's lives in the incarceration camps, but that was an exception to the rule. So Japanese Americans were not allowed to document their life in the camps. The United States government hired photographers to essentially produce propaganda to show that Japanese Americans were Americanizing and that they were ha even happy in incarceration facilities. Some of you may know these famous photographers, but Dorothea Lange and Ansel Adams were hired by the United States government to take photographs of incarceration. And there are a number of books out there and exhibits that document their photographs, some of which were not published by the United States government until much later on. In terms of physical harm, people were physically removed from their homes in the name of safety. They were only allowed to take one suitcase with them. So imagine packing all of your belongings into one suitcase. I mean, I can't get stuff for a trip in one suitcase half the time. So people weren't allowed to bring anything beyond one suitcase of items to incarceration facilities and had to leave everything behind with the plan of never returning to get, that, get those items. Um, people had to leave their pets behind, although some of them were able to convince the US government to allow them to bring pets. That again was the exception to the rule. When they arrived in permanent incarceration facilities, these incarceration camps were really designed with the military in mind. They were military barracks. The barracks were flimsy. They had poor insulation, depending on where people were sent, usually in uh, the rural west. It could be really cold or it could be really hot. So people were very miserable living in these, these wooden barracks. Uh, the barracks had uh, no these very flimsy partitioning walls. So there'd be one big barrack and then there'd be several families living in a barrack. And then there'd be a partitioning wall separating the families. And a lot of the oral histories and letters document how people felt like it an invasion of their privacy. They could hear their neighbors intimate conversations and um, that bothered them greatly as I'm sure you can imagine. The bathrooms, the shower facilities were absolutely not designed with um, the elderly or children in mind. Uh, they also kind of took away people's individuality and tried to de uh, dehumanize them. So the bathrooms had no partitioning walls between um, stalls. Same with the showers, it's like one big showering room. So kind of imagine a military installation and what it would look like 
that's what incarceration facilities look like. So um, people figured out ways to make sure that uh, people's um, privacy was maintained. So some people would stand in front of the bathroom and let other people know if someone was in there. But there are also accidents that happen because of these designs. So children are known to fall through the pit toilets because these were not designed for children to use. Um, there was a lack of hot water, as I mentioned, in some of the assembly centers. That, that was also true of some of the incarceration facilities, the permanent installations when people arrived there. They didn't have hot water. They didn't have medical facilities. Uh, they couldn't, you know, boil diapers. They didn't have sanitary pads and napkins. So these were not designed with people in mind at all, at all. In terms of economic violence, the loss of businesses, property, and jobs totaled approximately four to five billion dollars. That's an estimate of how much money the Japanese American community lost because of incarceration. So people were forced out of their homes, forced out of their communities, had to leave their businesses behind. And a lot of people couldn't return to those businesses after incarceration. When people left, they had no idea how long the war was going to go on. So they were forced out of communities. In some cases, developers came in and built businesses in those areas. Reparations were made in 1988. Um, with President Ronald Reagan's authorization of the Civil Liberties Act and President George H.W. Bush's amendment of that act. Families of formerly incarcerated Japanese Americans were given $20,000 in a letter of apology. However, that did not apply to the people that I'll be talking about today. So in order to receive that $20,000, you had to be a legal documented American citizen. Now that applied to the majority of people who are incarcerated, but it did not ap apply to the people that I have been studying. Some of the people that I'll be talking about today were also forcibly kidnapped by the United States government from Panama, uh, Mexico, and Peru. And the, the reason that the United States government did that and then placed them in the incarceration facility I'll be talking about today is because the United States government had planned to take those Japanese folks and exchange them for American citizens who are prisoners of war in Japan. So those people who the government forcibly kidnapped, who were of Japanese ethnicity, but living in Mexico, Panama, and Peru, they, were, they did not qualify for that $20,000 in reparations. Um, in terms of linguistic violence, you've heard me kind of code switch and use different words today. And the reason is because a lot of the language that was used to describe the incarceration process of Japanese Americans is considered very euphemistic. So the United States government tried to downplay what was happening to Japanese American, Japanese Americans by using very euphemistic language like calling Japanese American incarcerees colonists, uh, evacuees. So language that implied that perhaps a natural uh, disaster occurred and they had to evacuate or that people were colonists and voluntarily left their communities to settle in internment camps, which is not correct. So um, scholars of World War II incarceration tend to use phrases that more adequately capture what happened to Japanese Americans, such as prisoners, detainees, um, uh, incarceration facilities, prisons. Some scholars use the term concentration camps to describe what happened to Japanese Americans and where they were placed, uh, but that some people choose not to because of its association with the Holocaust. So I usually use incarceration, detainee, incarcerated, incarcerated prisoner when I give these talks and try to give a bit of a history as to why I choose the language I do. All right, so now going on to the Kuski internment camp and a little bit of history of this site and how I got involved with it. With it. So I no longer live in Idaho where the site is. In 2000, I believe it was seven, it's been a while, I was hired as a tenure track faculty member at the University of Idaho. And I was a historical archeologist, I still am. Um, and one of my colleagues, Dr. Priscilla Wagers, who runs the Asian American Comparative Collection at the University of Idaho, and is also a historical archaeologist and someone I had known prior to coming to U of I, approached me and told me about her research on the Kuski internment camp. And she had been researching the site since the 1980s. She had interviewed people who were both incarcerees as well as people who worked there as prison officials. And she had done substantial archival research at the National Archives and a number of other places that hold federal documents. And she was writing a book on Kuski. 
she had read about the National Park Service's new grant program. Um, this is called the Japanese American Confinement Sites Grant Program that supports research on World War II sites associated with Japanese Americans. And she encouraged me to apply for a grant to do research at Kuski. She took me out to the site. She was super willing to share all her data. She shared the list of the survivors and descendant community with me so I could communicate that I'm thinking of doing this project. Uh, and since then, she's she's been a fantastic colleague and friend to me. I owe her everything that this project is because of her and the work she's done, as well as the descendant community and survivors. So um, I got a grant from the National Park Service to run a field school in 2010. And at, like most academics, I also kind of have to justify why I want to do research at this site. Well, this site is really unique. It's very different than a lot of the other incarceration facilities that house Japanese Americans or incarcerated them. And so the, I'll give you a little bit of history as to why it's, it's unique. Well, first off, the Kuski internment camp was designed for imprisoning people who were deemed enemy aliens by the United States government. That sounds like a really scary phrase, but none of these men committed any crimes. None of them did anything. The reason that they were considered a threat by the United States government is because they were community leaders uh, businessmen, successful folks in their communities, they could organize people around an issue or cause, and they were seen as a threat. Some of them also did work for the US government spying on Japan prior to war. So they were targeted. There are about 260 men, a little bit over 260 men incarcerated at the Kuski internment camp from May 1943 to May 1945. All the men there were considered non-citizens. So they had been, a lot of them had been in the United States for quite a long time, had built their lives here, had families here, had children who were, were citizens, but they themselves could not get citizenship because of racially exclusionary laws at the time that forbade them from obtaining US citizenship. So even if some of them wanted citizenship, which it seems like some of them did, they could not obtain it. There was no legal pathway for them to obtain it. So they were first generation migrants because they didn't have citizenship and first generation Japanese migrants are known as Issei. So there's kind of a unique demographic composition of people, a unique history to this site. And then another kind of unique thing about Kuski is that as they said, these men were not citizens. Now, none of them were, were taken from Japan. They weren't fighting in the war. They were here in the United States. Uh, some of them I mentioned were taken from other parts of the world, but none of them came from Japan during um, fighting in war, World War II. These men, because they were not citizens, were subjected to the 1929 Geneva Convention. And that meant that they were guaranteed certain rights. And we'll explore those in just a minute there. But one of the questions that I had um, on this slide here about this site is were Kuski's prisoners who are non-citizens, undocumented citizens treated better than the Japanese Americans who are, were citizens and were uh, imprisoned in what we call WRA camps, war relocation authority camps. So were they treated better at Kuski because they were, the, they were um, uh, the Geneva Convention applied to them? So I'm still trying to answer that question. I'll try to give you some um, conclusions today, but I'm, I'm at the tail end of this project where I feel like I will have some solid conclusions in a year or two. But I, I think the answer is yes, that they were generally treated better than Japanese American citizens, which kind of goes against what maybe some people think about the incarceration experience that people who were citizens would have been treated better, but that certainly was not the case. All right, just going back here. So this is a, um, an outline of why the United States government cared about complying to, with the Geneva Convention. So this is a document, it's called Instructions Concerning the Treatment of an, uh, Alien Enemy Det Detainees, which are the prisoners who were held at Kuski. And the reason that the United States government was so concerned about following the guidelines of the Geneva Convention and making sure that the prison officials and um, employees at Kuski were adhering to the Geneva Convention is because the United States government was concerned that if we did not comply with the Geneva Convention, that our prisoners of war during the war would be treated poorly. 
so that's what this this part of the document is hi highlighting and throughout the talk today i'll be highlighting parts of this document which interpret the geneva convention and what it actually means in practice for the people that were running the kuski internment camp and some of the people that ran the kuski internment camp were not good people and actually got let go because they were not complying with the geneva convention all right, so these are kind of my big research questions. What were, um, what, how were prisoners treated during their time at the Kuski internment camp? We have a rich archival history. We have diaries from the prisoners. We have work orders. We have letters and correspondence. Now, some of you may know this, but a number of the letters that were sent between incarceration facilities or sent out of incarceration facilities were indeed censored if the government decided that they didn't like what the prisoners were saying or were saying negative things. Um, and, and obviously the archeolo archeological data is the other data source for answering this question. All right, so I wanted to give you a brief timeline history of the site itself, the site upon which the Kuski internment camp is located. So it has a, a very complex history that's really um, not represented very well with these slides. Uh, it is uh, Nez Perce land, from time immemorial to present, but the United States government took that land from the Nez Perce in the past and converted it into a number of facilities. So at one point it was a Civilian Conservation Corps of Engineers camp, CCC camp, used to build what is today US Highway 12. It then was converted into Canyon Creek Federal Prison and that again was used to build parts of what is now US Highway 12, which is a bridge between Idaho and Montana, a very important bridge that a lot of us have utilized to get to Montana. And then finally, it was converted into the Kuski internment camp and opened in May 1943 and closed in May 1945. And the prisoners at Kuski continued to help build US Highway 12. So one of the other unique things about Kuski is that the prisoners were allowed to labor. And they were allowed access to things they really shouldn't have had access to and did not have access to in the war relocation authority camps, such as gasoline and vehicles and dynamite. So they had access to all of those things. Just so you have a sense of where Kuski is located, it's located in a still pretty rural area of Idaho, although a good part of Idaho is still pretty rural. When we worked there, there's no cell phone service and internet. It's about two and a half hours away from of a hospital and the University of Idaho where I worked. And here's a close up of the landscape upon which we worked. So you'll see there's a little icon down at the bottom here that says Kuski internment camp. That's where we spent most of our time working in 2010. I was able to get another grant from the uh, National Park Service's Japanese American Confinement Sites Grant Program to do more research on the site and excavation 2013. And then we've been doing lab work ever since. Almost done though, it's exciting. So this, where this icon is and where it says Kuski internment camp, this is where the barracks were located that were associated with the men that were incarcerated there. Um, if you look kind of further north in this image, you'll see an icon that says Apgar campground. This is where the prison officials live. So the prison officials lived about a half a mile away from the Kuski internment camps barracks. Uh, Dr. Priscilla Wagers, uh, the scholar who I mentioned, taught me about this site and spent lots of time researching it and has written two books on the site now. Um, she had the uh, foresight to, when she interviewed the prison officials back in the 1980s and the incarcerees to ask them where they were throwing their trash. And that's a really important question for us archaeologists because we want to know if people are throwing their trash in the same location as, say, another group of people. And she found that the prison officials trash was being trucked out of the site, according to them. And the prisoners trash was being thrown right across the creek from them, which could be a, a good example of kind of environmental racism there. So now we're, we're here at the archeology span part of the talk. And I'll talk a little bit about our methods. Um, we focused our efforts on the barracks site first, because I was hoping to find artifacts that were directly associated with prisoners and perhaps some structures or buildings that were associated with them. So in this historic photograph, you can see the barracks, the rectangle that I've drawn on that historic photograph is kind of the general area that's pictured in the contemporary photograph here. So when we got out to the site in 2010, well, I drove up to it a couple times before that, but when I went out to the site, a number of us kept saying how the photographs that we were looking at just seemed 
a lot different. It seemed more level. The landscape looked more level. And I think some of us just kind of were like, well, maybe it's the angle at which the historic photographs are taken. Maybe it's in our head. But there's there was a reality to that. And I'll get to that in a minute. Another area of the site that we explored was the trash dump and an incinerator. Incinerators are used even in today's world to burn often organic trash if you don't have regular pickup. Uh, animal bones or uh, any food stuff that's left over is often burned in an incinerator so you don't attract wildlife. So this incinerator and the trash dump were directly associated with the prisoners, not the prison officials. And if you look at the historic photograph, this is a creek that runs through the site that divides the landfill from the prisoner barracks. And there were a number of bridges so that people could cross, vehicles could uh, across. Those bridges were removed, we believe, in May 1945 when they dismantled the site. The buildings on the site were relocated, and some of the archaeologists working for the Forest Service have um, located these buildings on Forest Service property, so they were also moved to different parts of the Forest Service and probably different parts of Idaho as well and sold off. Though, so as I said, those vehicle bridges, the bridges were taken down, and we had to cross the creek fairly regularly <laughs> to do our archaeological work, which some years posed a bigger challenge than others because the creek really turns into a river when we have a lot of snow. So there's a, a short period of time when we can cross this creek. And that also meant that the landfill and the dump had really been protected from the public, although there's not a lot of people that really come out here and disturb the landscape. All right, so what did we find in the barracks? Well, as I said, we drove in we kept saying that it looks like there's some sort of incline here and it doesn't look like the historic photographs. So what we did is we did ground penetrating radar. Dr. Robert Hines, who's faculty member at the University of Idaho at the time, generously provided his services and helped us do GPR on the landscape. And then we did extensive shovel testing, which for those of you who are not archeologists is essentially sticking a shovel on the ground, going about a meter and a half or a meter down in the ground, screening that soil, and trying to see what's under the ground without digging giant holes and destroying the landscape. It's a pretty invasive process because you're digging a lot of holes across the landscape, but it does give you a sense of if the site has been disturbed, if there is an archeological site there, if there's a building there. So, so the results of the shovel testing and the ground penetrating radar survey. So we did find a building, we think it was a wash house, but unfortunately there wasn't any archeology span associated with the building and we decided we wouldn't spend that much time on it. And the reason why is because you'll see this photograph with a man holding a big rock. This is Josh Allen, he's now an archeologist, um, one of my former students a long time ago. So we did, dug these shovel tests and we kept hitting huge rocks. We hit pieces of asphalt and we were finding projectile points that were thousands of years old in the same soil layer, in the same little soil layer as historic beer can pull tabs. And that told us something really important. That told us that the site had been disturbed. It had been churned up, something had happened there. Well, it just so happens that as we we're on the site, it's the first field season one day, and this was like well into shovel testing. So it wasn't like the first day, which would have been wonderful, but it wasn't. We have two guys come up to us from Michigan Department of Transportation who had just stopped there to have lunch. I guess it was their lunch site and asked what we were doing. We explained what we were doing. And they told us that they thought that people had been dumping highway related debris on this site since the 1960s. And I think that is what happened. So US Highway 12 has a lot of mudslides and landslides that make the, the road completely impassable. You cannot get to Montana, you cannot get to the grocery store when these things happen. And there's no signage out on the site. So a lot of people don't realize that this was the Kuski internment camp, in, including people that are locals. They don't know that that's the location of Kuski because the town of Kuski, Idaho is about 30 minutes away from the site. So some people assume that that Kuski internment camp was located near Kuski, Idaho, when it actually wasn't. So that's kind of a sad story and how a historic site was sort of destroyed and prehistoric site was destroyed simply because there isn't signage. I'm not blaming anyone. That's just the reality of doing archaeology nowadays on federal land is we don't have, have enough archaeologists working in federal agencies to monitor all the destruction that can happen incidentally, accidentally. 
So then we turned our attention to the landfill. Uh, this was not my first landfill, probably won't be my last. I've been in a lot of landfills. And if I had the opportunity to do this project all over again, I probably would change a number of our methods. But we spent 2010 and 2013 in a landfill digging and um, digging prisoners trash. And the units were really dense. We found art, more artifacts than dirt as we were digging them. So they took a long time to excavate. As you can see, this unit was just filled with artifacts. So what did we find? Uh, well, just to give you a sense of how long it's taken to us to process data. When we left the field in 2010, it took us a year, about a year and a half to clean all the artifacts from that field season, just to clean and like curate them and get them into a state where they could be cataloged. So that wasn't cataloging. And then it took another year and a half to clean and, clean and curate all the artifacts from 2013. So everything has pretty much been cataloged by this point. <laughs> and we're at the point where we're doing what we call minimum number of individual vessels analysis. If anyone is working on institutional sites or incarceration sites, I'm happy to share our data with, the, with you. We have lots of data online as well as sort of like, you know, in a folder that's shared with people working on this topic, but we're close to being done. Not quite there, but close. So because we're almost there, I feel pretty comfortable making some of the conclusions I'm gonna to make today. So one of the things that the Kuski, and the, uh, Kuski prisoners were guaranteed was a certain allotment of food and also certain types of food based off their ethnicity and heritage, which it says in this document here again, this is a document that's the federal government's interpretation of the Geneva Convention. And they're also allowed to prepare their own food. So uh, I think we see that reflected in the archeological assemblage at some of the World Relocation Authority camps that were, were the places where Japanese American citizens were in prison. They weren't given access to food or to the kitchens, uh, kitchens to cook their food. So that's a little bit different than what we see at Kuski. And I think the ceramic assemblage reflects that. So um, one of the things someone said to me early on in this project was, well, you're probably not gonna find a lot of Japanese manufactured ceramics because why would men bring them with them um, when they only have one suitcase with them? And, and yeah, so we did find Japanese manufactured ceramics and these are ceramics people would have had to brought with them. So they probably had some sentimental meaning to them and most of the ceramics that we find are bowls. And why is that important? Well, I'll tell you in just a minute. All right, so the majority of our ceramic assemblage are these white institutional wares that were issued by the United States government. So as we were digging, we kept observing that we were finding so many bowls. But if you look at the historic photographs that were taken of Kuski by the government, again, these, this is propaganda, you see people eating on flatware. Well, we have way more bowls, way more institutional bowls than flatware. And that is a reflection of the fact that Kuski's prisoners were allowed to consume traditional Japanese foods here. And that was part of the, the Geneva Convention is allowing them to consume foods that they wanted to consume. The US government kind of went out of its way to procure items that Japanese American incarcerees at Kuski wanted, which was not happening at the War Relocation Authority camps where you have eight to 10,000 people incarcerated there. So we see that reflected in the Anglo-American ceramic assemblage here. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this teal plate here. This is Fiesta Ware. It was really popular in, uh, in California in the 1920s and 30s. This would have been brought by Japanese Americans with them to internment camps. We also have some orange Fiesta Ware, and that has uranium in it. So if you have that, don't eat on that. You're not going to die, but just don't eat on it. So this is something that people would have brought with them, and they do find this at other incarceration sites. This has been found at every other incarceration camp that's been excavated. So this is something that people brought with them, probably in anticipation of not having all the things that they would need to eat on and, and consume. We also have lots of chocolate bar wrappers, which I thought was really interesting. Um, the, so the men were allotted a certain amount of sweets and desserts at, as part of the Geneva Convention. And we see, see evidence of that in the archeological record. I had a student who is, uh, most of my students are way smarter than me. Um, <laughs> I had a student come up to me in the lab and had this wad of tin foil in her hand and said, do you think, what do you think this is? I was like, well, that looks like trash, which is the dumbest thing to say because I'm an archeologist who studies people's trash. So she carefully unfolded 
this tin foil. And this is what we found. So we were able to date them and identify them. And um, that was kind of exciting. In terms of recreation, so when the prisoners arrived there in May 1943, they realized that the US government was not in compliance with the Geneva Convention. They had nothing to do. This is a very real part of Idaho. Like I said, it was very real back then and it still is to this day. And it was very difficult for them to envision passing their time all day long with absolutely no recreation. So some of the artifacts that we found, I think reflect the fact that when they arrived there, they didn't have anything to do are these gaming pieces. So the gaming pieces in the bottom that are circular are gaming pieces that were used in a game called Go or Wei Che. And I've seen these on other historic Chinese American sites. Um, anyone who works out in the West probably knows what these are, has seen them on historic sites. But what's unique about our, our pieces is that they're not mass manufactured. So the prisoners made these at the Kuski internment camp. And this is not the only thing they made to pass the time. We'll look at that in just a second. So I had an undergraduate, David Monero, study these and he took them into a material science lab. So we kind of figured out what they're made of. Uh, another gaming piece that we think is a Majan piece potentially is made out of bone up at the top there. And here's a historic photograph of the men playing that game, trying to pass their time. Eventually they did get access to films and books and a theater, but when they first arrived there, they really had nothing. So artwork, we have a lot of artwork we found on the site and um, a lot of the incarcerees at other sites were also making art and unique art forms or art firms that were unique to that particular incarceration facility. So these, these pieces here that have rocks embedded in them and lithics embedded in them, they were made, handmade at Kuski. Uh, the piece of artwork with an anthropomorphic figure, dog, otter, we're not really sure, that was carved into local sandstone by someone on the site and found on the surface. All of these were found on the surface of the site. This rock art is, it looks to be a tradition that started potentially at Fort Missoula Detention Center, which is where a number of Kuski's prisoners were held until they were transferred over to the Kuski internment camp. So you can see they were used as a pencil holder, as a, a plant holder, as a vase. And again, I think this speaks to the fact people were trying to pass their time. So they were engaging in art forms that they may not have ever done until they, they came to um, the incarceration facilities. And this doesn't really necessarily have to do with recreation and leisure, but it's one of my favorite artifacts that we've recovered. And it speaks to the fact that people were trying to bring something that reminded them of home. Now, some of these incarcerees had families at other incarceration facilities. The, the family members may have sent this in the mail, maybe it broke when it got there, or perhaps one of the incarcerees packed it in their suitcase and it broke when it got there. It's hard to say. But this is an heirloom. It's from Japan, dates from 1891 to 1921. Obviously nothing was coming into the United States during World War II from Japan. So all the ceramics that we've seen that are from Japan predate the war. But this has a, a dragon on it made out of clay on porcelain. So it was a large vase. All right, health and medicine. Um, probably the, one of the biggest problems at the Kuski internment camp when the incarcerees arrived there was the fact that they had no doctor and no dentist. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, most of these men were older. They were older gentlemen, gentlemen who had, were in their 50s, 60s. I don't think 50s that old, but um, to be put in a prison at that age and not have access to adequate health care is a problem. So when they arrived, they realized that Again, the United States government was out of compliance and was not following the stipulations outlined in the Geneva Convention. And the prisoners petitioned the United States government along with prison officials, and I'll tell you why in a minute, to make sure that they had all the things they needed that were guaranteed to them under the Geneva Convention. So as I mentioned, they were working on US Highway 12. They were building parts of it, dynamiting it, even though they weren't supposed to be handling that. Eventually they were told they couldn't. Um, but they had, a number of them had glaucoma and eye problems. And we see that in the archeological record. And I think part of the reason they had eye problems was because of the documents that <laughs> illustrate that they didn't have the safety equipment they were supposed to have to do this work when they first arrived there. So a number of the prison officials were angry that the Japanese American incarcerees didn't have access to safety materials, things that would protect them while doing this work. And um, one of the reasons I think they were so vocal uh, about this issue 
Uh, some of them seem like nice people. But one of the reasons I think they're so vocal about these problems was because they were disgruntled employees. The person who was running the prison had run the federal prison and was treating the Japanese American incarcerees like federal prisoners. So he was not treating them with respect. He was also treating the prison officials with disrespect. And so everyone was kind of angry. And so the prison officials worked with the Japanese American incarcerees to write this petition stating that they were not being treated the way they were supposed to be treated under the Geneva Convention. You can see in this letter here that one of the people working at Kuski documented how a Japanese man had, had his near, ear nearly severed by a falling rock, that they didn't have safety boots, safety belts, safety helmets, goggles. Well, um, and this is a description of the person who was running the prison, who had uh, run the federal prison before, his name was Reamer. His colleague saw him as an intolerant, inconsiderate, uncooperative, condescending, barely friendly, openly opposed to the liberal treatment of internees and given to passive resistance when faced with suggested reforms. This is the, the a letter written by one of his colleagues saying that he needed to be removed. Let's see if I can hopefully get to the next slide. It kind of froze up, there we go. So Reamer violated a number of aspects of the Geneva Convention, but one was the humane treatment of prisoners. And he certainly was not abiding by this at all. At one point, he had left prisoners out in the rain miles away from the site and um, the car had broken down and the prisoners had to walk back in the rain and the prison officials and prisoners described it as just like humiliating and also something that a number of the older men just physically struggled with to get back. So Reamer got fired because of the cooperation between the prison officials and Kuski's prisoners. And eventually Kuski's prisoners obtained access to the things they needed. So this is an example. These are archaeological examples of things that the prisoners were able to obtain because of that petition. So sunglasses were absolutely necessary working out there. Safety goggles, we've reconstructed. Dr. Leah Evans, Janky, who's a former colleague of mine at the University of Idaho, is an incredible illustrator and archaeologist. She drew this illustration of the safety goggles that these artifacts would have been a part of. So we were able to identify exactly what they were, would have looked like back in the 1940s. And here's a close up of the parts of the safety goggle artifacts. And we have a lot of Marines eye serum. And I think that again is related to the fact that the prisoners did not have adequate access to medical treatment for their eye issues, which were some of them were pre existing, as well as eye issues that arose because of their work on US Highway 12. They were consuming Marine's eye serum um, before they arrived at the Kuski internment camp and before they were incarcerated. That, that's one of the kind of questions I've been asked is how much of this material culture were people consuming before incarceration? And I'll talk about my, my future research, kind of sort of current research project that's been put on hold because of the pandemic. But that's one of our big questions is how much did people's material lives change over the course of incarceration? So we know people were using this particular product before incarceration. So it may have been something people brought with them, anticipating that they might not have good medical care, or it could have been something that was prescribed to them at the facility. And then this is a, a, a we have two of these bottles, and these are kind of unique. It's to, it's to my knowledge, this is the only example of this particular medicinal product being found at any of the incarceration sites. This uh, is a Wakamoto Pharmaceutical Company medicinal supplement. It's a gastrointestinal supplement called Source of Youth. And it was particularly marketed to older people. So it's kind of interesting that you're finding this at a site where there's older people who are having to do physical labor and they're consuming something that they clearly would have brought with them. This is not something they would have been able to obtain while incarcerated. They would have brought with them to the camp. So this dates 1929 to 1943, but again, they would have had to buy it before being incarcerated. And this is what the uh, complete bottles look like. So we have one aqua bottle and we have one brown bottle. And Wakamoto Pharmaceutical Company still exists today. So we were able to email them in 2011 and obtain examples of the historic advertisements, which was great. They responded super quick, which was amazing. So we have a sense of what those bottles look like in the past. We have a lot of toothpaste, a lot of toothbrushes. Uh, we have one toothbrush that has Japanese characters on it. We've had a couple different translations because it's kanji. Um, 
But what's interesting about this toothbrush is to our knowledge, only one other toothbrush like this has been found in the United States. And it was found in a dig on Terminal Island associated with a Japanese community that predates incarceration. And a number of the men who were incarcerated in Kuski, Idaho, came from Terminal Island. So maybe that there was a store selling this particular toothbrush, but I know there's gotta be a bigger story behind it that maybe someday we'll, we'll find out or discover. And then we found denture molds, which I've never found on an archeological site. We found fake teeth, which is down here below. And as I said, when they arrived, they did not have a dentist. They had a petition for a dentist and they did get a dentist. Um, and I think a lot of these artifacts that we found reflect the age of the people that were there, such as the denture molds and teeth, fake teeth. So going back to that kind of original question that I posed at the beginning of the talk, you know, were Kuski's prisoners treated better than WRA prisoners who were American citizens due to the Geneva Convention? I think the answer is yes. I, I think there still needs to be a bit more research and comparative work done, which is a whole other talk, but I'm, I'm not gonna go there today. But I pulled this, this description, a letter that was sent to uh, incarcerate at Fort Missoula from his child who was held in an assembly center. So this is not a permanent, um, permanent incarceration facility. This kind of describes the conditions which were much worse than Kuski. Even when Kuski's prisoners arrived there, they, and at Fort Missoula, which was another uh, detention center for people deemed enemy aliens, things were much better there. People were, were pretty happy <laughs> given the situation. This is a description of, of the assembly center that was designed for Japanese Americans. So we reached Camp Harmony yesterday at about 10 o'clock in the morning. It was very hard to fix everything without you. There are fences all around the camp with guards watching. The houses we live in are one long house which can shelter six families. So those are the barracks that have partitioning walls between them. Our three families are living next to each other. We are living in the middle of three families. Everything is inc very inconvenient. We made mattresses out of straw so they didn't have mattresses. The room smells like an elephant's pen. We got new beds and a new blanket. There is a stove in the center of every room, one small window and a door. There are holes in the wall, so we cover it with cardboard or boards. Again, no insulation. The food we eat isn't bad, but it doesn't taste like the ones we used to eat at home. We eat in one big hall. It is very cold in the hall. There is one big lavatory in our camp. That's the bathroom. The lavatory has only two sinks and the whole camp has to wash and drink water from that sink. The showers are awful, no curtains. The showers are all in one place, back to back. No hot water except in the mess hall. So the conditions are very different than what you see at Kuski. All right, so I'm gonna transition from the archeology span to community outreach, and then I hopefully have some time for questions. Um, so community outreach is a really important part of archeology. span I'm sure many of you know that public outreach is essential. None of the people who are incarcerated or survived incarceration are in the surrounding area of Kuski, Idaho. So there are some people who are descendants of the prison officials that were at Kuski internment camp. And people were very interested in the site's history. Like I said, a number of them didn't even know where the location was of the Kuski internment camp. So we did a number of public archeology span days. We brought youth out to the site when we were working in the barracks area, it's not safe to bring youth across the creek. So we, we don't do that. And we also partnered with Three Rivers Resort um, to do a number of youth summer camps and youth camps so they could learn about archeology span and learn about the history that was in their community. Uh, one of the things I think is really important as an archeologist who's worked all over the rural west is that we need to make sure that when we leave the site, people feel like they have ownership over the site and are site stewards. And, and keep an eye out for things that might be happening at the site. So that was like kind of my biggest worry is that I'd leave the site and people now knew about it and perhaps something would happen. But I feel like the community has really tried to do their best to, to protect this site and keep the history and knowledge of it alive. Just a few months ago, I think it was last month, the Lewiston Tribune, which is a local newspaper, wrote a story about this project and about Japanese American incarceration. So. Um, the locals are definitely trying to keep this story alive, as is Priscilla Wagers, who's worked at the site for a very long time, like I've said. In terms of sharing what we were doing, uh, when I was at the University of Idaho, they did a really good job of marketing what we were doing, shared it with all kinds of media outlets, and because of that work that they did, 
Um, we ended up in international media like Huffington Post, Der Spiegel, Fuji News came out from Japan and did a story on us, which was fantastic. Um, I think the only downside of that is that there were a lot of people who came out and said really racist, xenophobic things on some of these publications. At one point, there were 8,000 comments on the Huffington Post article about this site. And a lot of that was pretty hateful rhetoric that we all have seen increase uh, over the last six, seven years. We share our data. As I said, we have come in an open data sharing ethos on this project. So if you go to internmentarchaeology.org, you can see all of the data that's been cataloged thus far. There's still some things that we're entering every day pretty much. Um, but you can see a lot of the artifacts and see the archaeology. And let's see, last year I got a grant for the National Park Service's Japanese American Confinement Sites Grant Program with my colleague, Dr. Ethan Waltrell to build this out and make it an accessible digital platform for the public and descendant communities and survivors. So we have an advisory board um, that advises on the kind of content that will go on there, including 3D models of artifacts and artifacts that relate to four themes that have been identified as essential by uh, descendant community and the advisory board. So future research, I probably will step away from this project once we no longer have funding for it it's, it's been pretty much my, my career, <laughs> my career's work. So I'm at the end of it. There's lots of data to publish. So once the collection is finished um, being analyzed and returned to the University of Idaho, then I, I think I'll probably just focus on publication. But there's a lot of research avenues for other scholars who are interested in this topic. There's also a young generation of the Senate community who are passionate about studying their family's history that are quite capable and more capable than me of doing this kind of work. But these are some of the things that I think would be really useful um, for people who are working on this topic in the future. So synthesis of data, cataloging all the data in a systematic way using the same standardized vocabulary from all the World War II Japanese American incarceration sites would be fantastic so that we can do really solid uh, comparative research of what life was like in some camps versus others. Was it better at one and not as great at another and why? Why was it just the Geneva Convention? Or was it better at one WRA camp versus another and why? Why were those differences there? Uh, mapping the global circulation of goods from incarceration sites. So we do know people were mailing some items between incarceration camps, but I'm not sure I, that would be something I think someone could write a whole dissertation on and explore is how did these goods circulate between camps? Uh, a longitudinal analysis of Japanese American consumption patterns. I'm part of this research already, but one of the big questions I've had and that I've already mentioned is how do people's material lives change over the course of incarceration? So to answer that question, you need data prior to incarceration and data after incarceration. And I'll get back to that in a minute. And then transnational work in Japan. We know that Japan was modernized way before the West and had fantastic commodities and uh, sanitation in their communities. So there's been some good books talking about what Japan was like in the 1700s and 1600s and in terms of the consumer market and sanitation, but that would be a fantastic uh, couple of dissertations. So Getting back to that question that I just mentioned of, of trying to explore what Japanese Americans lives were prior to incarceration, after incarceration. One of the projects that I started up prior to the pandemic and then um, had a colleague of mine, Dr. Koji Laozawa, join me on is studying uh, J Japanese Americans lives in Santa Barbara, California prior to World War II incarceration. And there is an archeological collection there that is incredible, it's super rich and has not been explored in depth at all. Luckily, the archaeologists working on the site of this Japanese American community had the foresight to collect the data and, and do some pretty good provenience, um, info, provenience recording. This site was excavated in the 1960s, so it was technically like 30, 40 years old when the archaeologists were excavating. They were excavating on the site of a Presidio, a Spanish colonial settlement. And we're not excavating for this particular community, but again, they collected the data and now we, uh, Koji Laozal and myself, are working to catalog this data and hopefully get a grant to share it eventually because we haven't been able to go back to Santa Barbara, California due to the pandemic. So that's a new project that will hopefully help us answer that question of how people's material lives dramatically change during the course of incarceration. 
Um, and two other websites that I suggest people take a look, a look at, I've already said Densho, but 50objects.org and wakasamemorial.org, great websites for exploring the materiality of incarceration during World War II. All right, so that is the end of my talk. I'm happy to answer questions. Hopefully we have some time and thank you again for being great listeners. I appreciate it. Thank you, that was excellent. So yeah, so uh, a few questions. One I have, just cause I like to know things. Um, your website with the open source data, can you actually see what objects people like look at the most and kind of track data that way? And we can on this one. Not the one that's up right now, but I think the one that's coming up that should be up probably by the end of next year or maybe August of next year. The, yes, I think we can see that because that would uh, be a great article of looking at what people are, yeah, what people are looking at, what they're interested in. Um, the, the new digital platform that we're building looks very different than the one we have. It was developed with the public in mind and the Senate community in mind. So it's around four themes. Um, healthcare and medicine, uh, education, foodways and dining and recreation and leisure. And it's not just focusing on Kuski, it's focusing on uh, people who are incarcerated at Minidoka War Relocation Center, which is the other big incarceration facility in Idaho. So it's, it's basically looking at all of the lives of Japanese Americans that were incarcerated in Idaho during World War II. So it's a big project and I think we should be able to, to look at that, yeah. Excellent. Um, I just, like I say, I just, I'm nosy like that. <laughs> um, another question is, uh, what was the most exciting or surprising thing for you during this project that you found, encountered, whatever? The artwork really struck me. I, th I think just thinking about how people were trying to pass their time and trying to find beauty in, in a place that seemed... I don't know, a hostile environment. So Priscilla Wager's book about Kuski is, is entitled In Prison in Paradise. I actually have it right here. I have like 10 copies of it all over my house, but um, it's a fantastic book, really great book. Uh, lots of oral histories with survivors and their families. It's just a rich book. Um, and the reason it's ent entitled that is because a lot of the prisoners felt that it was paradise in comparison to other incarceration facilities or families were in. So you go to Amachi, for instance, in Colorado, or even Minidoka, it's a very different kind of landscape than Kuski, where you've got a river and you've got a forest. And it, it is beautiful out there. It's, it's a different feel. Um, but yeah, I don't know, the artwork really struck me. I, I've never found artwork on a site, and it just kind of brought it home that people were all by themselves, and they never knew, like, when they were going to see their family again, that, that vase, too, like, that someone had that with them, because it was so delicate and brought that with them I don't know it definitely it brought it home to me it made me pretty emotional to think about that yeah um we have another question were you able to determine where the institutional or hotel hotel wear ceramics were made yeah so a lot of them have a maker's mark with the date on <laughs> we love that I think they're Ohio but we have a whole if you're interested I can share a uh, a uh, Google Sheet document that we have of every ceramic we have <laughs> that we have recorded. So yes, we have all kinds of information, but it it's pretty much like one manufacturer and then a few others. It's nothing really um, extensive. They were they were buying it from one group of people that were manufacturing them. Excellent, um, Jenny. If you have a question, type it into the chat for me or in the Q and A. Hold on. Um, we have another question from Paul. Were these internment camps a West Coast thing or are there examples in other parts of the United States? There's a few examples in other parts of the US and the South. There's one in Arkansas, but for the most part, uh, it's in the uh, rural West. So away from cities, away from the coast, most of the people that were incarcerated were people that lived on the coast and were then taken away and, and put into these more isolated areas. So. So yes, but not a lot. Okay. Well, those were the questions I have from everyone. So thank you, Stacy, Dr. Camp, uh, for joining and talking with us today. And thank you to all our viewers for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next lecture, which will be on Wednesday, April 20th. And we will be joined by Dr. Troy Lovato, who will be speaking about arbor glyphs 
tree graffiti and its role in uh, Chicana uh, studies. And again, we rely on the support of viewers like you. So consider supporting our outreach by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. So have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.